He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. What glorious words they are. Hallelujah. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ is risen. And so we get to celebrate that today. Uh, we had a dark weekend as we considered Good Friday and and all that meant Jesus going to the cross for our sins. But today, as we just sang, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. All fear is gone. And so we praise the Lord for that. And so uh, as it would happen, uh, we have uh, just about wrapped up the Gospel of Mark on Resurrection Sunday, talking about the resurrection. And isn't God glorious uh, to time it out the way he did? And so uh, before we begin our sermon this morning, let's just go to him in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this most amazing day, uh, Lord, that you defeated sin, death, and Satan uh, in one fell swoop by, as we just sang, you went out of that grave, Lord, and, and what a glorious thing that is. It is the bedrock of our faith, and Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done for us, and uh, Lord, we just love you, and we thank you for the amazing uh, truths of, of this resurrection, and uh, Lord, what it means for us, and so uh, Lord, we just proclaim your name, we bless your holy name, Lord, and we just profess our love to you. May everything we say and do today be pleasing in your sight. We praise you in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Well, you may know uh, Winston Churchill uh, as the Prime Minister of England back in the 1940s uh, when he uh, led England and really the world uh, through this, uh, this World War II, the, the most horrible crisis of the 20, 20th century. Uh, so we know him as the Prime Minister, this aged man with the big cigar. Uh, but there was so much more to Winston Churchill than just his time as Prime Minister. Uh, in 1899, when he was still a young man, uh, he actually left the army and he became a journalist because he sought adventure. And so he asked them to send him to South Africa because he wanted to cover uh, what was called the Boer War, B-O-E-R, the Boer War. And so the Boers were South African people, uh, and they had territory, of course, that they occupied, uh, and they were very unhappy with the imperialism and colonialization that they thought the British were doing uh, in their territory. Uh, so that was bad enough, but then when gold was discovered in that territory, well, forget it, it was on, right? Uh, the battle for this territory really heated up. So uh, on November 15th, 1899, while Churchill is covering this war, he's riding a train uh, through their territory uh, with English soldiers on board. And so this very train that, that he was riding on was ambushed by these Boers, and uh, Churchill and a bunch of others were captive and taken as POWs. And there's a plaque there that you can see uh, to commemorate where that happened uh, even today. And so here's Churchill as a POW, that picture all the way on the right, uh, as a young man. Uh, he's in this, in this prisoner of war camp. And he objected to being held prisoner by them because he said, I am a journalist, I am not a soldier. But the Boers said, you're carrying a gun, even though you have a pad and paper, if you're carrying a gun, that makes you a soldier and we are holding you. And so after nearly a month of captivity, a Churchill and two other guys said, enough of this, we are escaping from this thing. And so uh, on December 12th, 1899, the planned night of escape, uh, the three of them approach the fence, uh, and two of these guys say, you know what, the, the guards are extra attentive tonight, it's too risky, we need to postpone this till tomorrow. And so they did, they went back to their barracks, but Churchill, uh, always the adventurous one, always the one seeking fame, he decided to make a rush for it by himself, and so he does. He rushes the fence, scales over the fence, just barely escapes the guards' notice, and starts to head out into to the field. Now the problem was that the other two guys were carrying the money, the map, the compass, everything. Churchill had nothing. The food, he had nothing. And so he doesn't know where he's going. He just starts running blindly out into the field. And this begins a 300 mile a harrowing journey that Churchill accomplishes before he gets to safety. But before he left, before he escaped from the prison, he left a note on his pillow. Isn't that just so arrogant to leave a note on your pillow? <laughs> it's just fantastic. And so he left it for a guy by the name of Louis D'Souza, who was the Secretary of War uh, for the Boers. Uh, and in typical Churchillian uh, wit and cheek, uh, this is what the note said. I have the honor to inform you that as I do not consider that your government has any right to detain me as a military prisoner, 
I have decided to escape from your custody. And regretting that I am unable to bid you a more ceremonious or personal farewell, I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient servant, Winston Churchill. I just think that's fantastic. So he returns to England uh, to a hero's welcome. He won a seat in Parliament, which he had lost earlier, and that launched his political career. And you can read all about this uh, escape from the Boers in a book uh, by a lady by the name of Candace Millard uh, called Hero of the Empire. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well, I'm telling you this story because on Easter Sunday, uh, just as Churchill uh, believed that the Boers had no right to hold him captive, and in fact, they couldn't hold him captive, so the same with Jesus and his death and his burial in the tomb. Jesus volunteered to die for our sins, and his confinement to the tomb was only temporary. He didn't leave a note as Churchill did, but the empty tomb speaks volumes, doesn't it? The empty tomb says, the grave has no right to hold me. And in fact, it didn't hold him. It couldn't hold him. And death had no right to hold him. And it didn't hold him. And it couldn't hold him. And the empty tomb says that Jesus is alive today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so Satan owned Friday night. He owned Saturday. But on Sunday morning, Jesus showed that he is the God and the Savior that he always said that he was. And so that's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. So we'll talk about what happened on that Easter morning, and then we'll talk about why it matters from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 7. Now, just to remember the scene, to set the scene, uh, Jesus had been uh, killed, right, crucified on Friday afternoon. Darkness settled over the land, and Jesus gave up his spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, And so Jesus uh, has now died on the cross. And his followers watched as Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body. Uh, They took the body down, gave it to to Joseph, and and Joseph wrapped it in linen and, and then anointed the body and buried him in his own personal tomb. And then everyone goes home devastated in time to celebrate the Passover, which uh, was the Sabbath uh, at this time as well. And I'm sure this was the worst Sabbath and Passover of their entire lives. They had placed all their hope in Jesus, all their hope. And so their followers expected him to change the world by establishing a new kingdom and and defeating the Romans and and reestablishing what had existed, uh, the glory of Israel under David and Solomon a thousand years earlier. And so his crucifixion just ripped their hearts right out of their chests. Uh, how, How could he die? How could our how could our Messiah, how could our Savior die? And so they spent their Sabbath grief-stricken, emotionally sapped, and perplexed from the highest of hope that something new was going to happen to the depths of despair that they could not fathom. And so as we come to Sunday morning, we have to remember that Jesus' followers did not expect to find that tomb empty on Sunday morning. They thought death was the end of the story. Of course they did, right? Death is death. It's final but everything is possible with God. And the great news is that if God can raise Jesus from the dead, and he did, that means he can raise us from the dead, and he will. And if he can raise us from the dead, that means that he can handle every problem that you have if you will just trust him with it, any problem that you have today. So the death of Jesus turned his followers' world upside down, but yet what these ladies, these women who went to the tomb on Sunday morning, just shook the world in a way that they could never have imagined and changed everything. So let's follow the women on their way to Jesus' tomb. We'll read verses 1 to 3. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome uh, bought spices so they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? So just consider this emotional roller coaster that they had been on since the prior Sunday, right? The prior Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Uh, They are cheering him, waving palm branches at him, yelling Hosanna, which means save now. Uh, And he's, he's, he's entering Jerusalem to the cheers and adulation of the crowd. And five days later, he was dead. He was dead. 
So their emotions crash from this highest height to this lowest low. Uh, so they, they're in despair and now, uh, now resignation as they, as they walk towards the tomb. Uh, verse 1 begins, when Sabbath was over. So the Sabbath lasts from sundown on Friday night to sundown on Saturday night. And so they slept that Saturday night and then walked to the tomb on Sunday morning. Can you imagine what this Passover would have been like? 24 hours of just abject misery as the reality of Jesus' death finally sinks in. He's not coming back. He is dead. And so they probably experienced many of the stages of grief that you see in those psychological cycles of grief. You know, the first one is, is denial, right? Denial that, that these Romans killed their Savior and the Jews conspired to do it. Anger, right? Filled with rage that this could happen and, and wanting to get even uh, with the people who did it. A depression, uh, our Savior is gone. Uh, now what? What do we do? And then resignation and acceptance. Uh, their leader and their friend uh, is, is gone. And how are we going to move on from this? And so how could they move on after this soul-crushing event? They ask themselves, what do we do now? Well, the women, for their part, they chose to try to channel their grief into a final outpouring of love. And so Mark mentions three of these women, Mary of Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Luke, in his gospel, mentions uh, Joanna and some other women. So there was a, a crowd of women, and they bought spices, and they brought them to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. And so uh, the Gospel of John, of course, tells us that Joseph had already anointed his body and put it in the tomb. So why would they want to anoint Jesus' body again? Well, Jews did not embalm like the Egyptians did, and so in that arid climate of Israel, bodies would decay very quickly, uh, and the, the, uh, the anointing would not slow the process of decay, but it would cover that stench of rotting flesh. But why would they care about that? Because Joseph had already sealed the tomb, uh, and there was no way that anybody was going to smell the body. So why? Why would they do that? The only reason that makes sense to me is that th these women just couldn't quite let go of Jesus. They, they loved him so much, and they, they figured if we can't have him alive, at least we're going to honor him in burial the best way we possibly can. And so they loved him so deeply, and the loss was so unbearable, uh, they planned to do the only thing they could do, like a final goodbye, a final anointing. But as the women are walking on their way, they remember the stone, right? The stone is a big impediment to them being able to access this body. And Mark is the only one who records this conversation. So let's just think about this. This is a typical first century uh, tomb. Uh, it could be a larger opening with a larger stone, but that's the general idea. That, that stone would roll over in, uh, in a track uh, that was slightly angled so that it could cover uh, the tomb. And so to move that stone back out of the way, they'd have to push it uphill, essentially, up the track to open up that tomb again. And so uh, this stone would have weighed tons. And so they finally think, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to move this stone? Uh, they, they, they could not have moved it in their own power. So we wonder, like, why did they not think of this up until this moment, right? This seems like a big deal. How are we going to move this stone? And it seems to me that that the explanation for why they hadn't thought of it was that their love for him was so great uh, that they just probably thought that they, that they would figure out a way or Jesus' love blinded them uh, so much to the practical realities of moving this stone that they just went forward and, and, and tried to anoint him the best they could. So they forgot the important detail of the stone. But I think what it tells us is, is that sometimes the task at hand is bigger than our strength, right? Sometimes God gives us a task that's bigger than our strength, or he asks us to do something that's more than we can do, or he asks us to undergo something that's more than we can possibly handle. And that is where we have to learn to rely on God, to make up for everything that we lack, which is so much because there's a limit to our strength and our power. And so we have to rely on God to do what only he can do. These women could not move the stone. But God could. God could move the stone. And so they march on towards the tomb. They fully expect the tomb to be empty. And as I said last week, Jesus was dead. No question about that. They knew where the tomb was because they witnessed the burial. Uh, so they knew where that was. And so the women came only to anoint his body. They weren't coming there looking for an empty tomb. But when they arrive, their despair and their resignation turns back to hope again. Verses 4 to 6. 
and looking up, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a robe, and they were amazed. But he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has, he has risen. He is not here. See, here is the place where they laid him. So they must have been shocked to see that this stone was already moved, right? Uh, the stone could not have moved by their power, or it would have taken a whole lot of people to move that stone. And so they probably wondered how the stone was moved or who moved the stone. Mark didn't explain it at all, but Matthew in his gospel says that an angel caused a great earthquake and he moved the stone. And I'm sure it took these ladies a while to figure out that the stone was not moved to let Jesus out. The stone was moved to allow these women to get in to the tomb. And I don't know if that moved stone gave them hope or, or any uh, cause for, for optimism, uh, but what it did give them was access to the tomb, and that is what they came for. And so in faith and in fear, they enter this tomb, uh, and that's when their resignation uh, turns back to hope again. They see a young man sitting there in, in a white robe, is how Mark describes it, uh, and we wonder why, they, why Mark would call him a young man. Uh, probably that is how the women perceived him. He looked like a young man uh, to the women, uh, but his clothes and his words to the women show that this man uh, is something supernatural. And in fact, Matthew says specifically that he was an angel, and the angel is the one who caused the earthquake and moved the stone. And so I think it's cool just to think of this image of an angel in a white robe, you know, sitting on this stone that he has rolled away, you know, kind of, you know, swinging his legs with this grin on his face, knowing that, that he knows something that they don't know that's about to rock their world, right? Uh, how cool that must be uh, to have seen that. And so they enter the tomb. Now, the tomb may have been some kind of complex of tombs, like what you see in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which is a, a church in Jerusalem now. See how they cut the tombs uh, perpendicular into the rock, but then there would be an outer room uh, where you could stand before you could go, where you would go into the tomb. And so this is what it might have looked like. And so the, the, the angel is sitting on a rock, and he's talking to these women, and he says, uh, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. See, here is the place where they laid him. What fantastic words. Do not be amazed. Are you kidding me? How could you not be amazed at this incredible news? Uh, your translations might say astonished or shocked or alarmed. And I'm sure that hearing these angels' words filled them with first confusion. You know, what are you talking about? He's not here. What do you mean he's raised? And then uh, gradually moves to hope and then, and then to joy. And the angel makes no mistake about, you know, who is buried here. This, you're looking for Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. So there's no mistaking his identity. And he confirms that they were in the right place. See, here is the place where they laid him. He has risen. And so seeing this tomb empty, their uh, hope uh, rises. Their, their despair dissipates uh, as, as, they, as they start to think about the possibility that Jesus is alive I just imagine this, you know, we have all lost people in our lives, right? Loved ones who we held so dear to us. And so imagine, you know, you go to the funeral, as, as we do, to say our final goodbyes. Uh, and then as you're leaving the funeral home, uh, you know, an angel taps you on the back and says, you know what, that loved one who you just left, that loved one is alive. And you're like, no, there's no way that loved one is alive. I just saw him, he was in the casket. So you go back into the funeral home and you say to the funeral director, open that casket. I just want to see one, one more time to be sure he's in there. The funeral director opens the casket and the casket is empty. And you're like, what happened to the body? Did you move the body? And the guy says, I didn't move the body. I don't know what happened to the body. And all of a sudden, now you have two pieces of evidence, right? The angel's testimony and an empty tomb, an empty casket. What does this mean? And so imagine how your heart might be stirred, how you might be filled uh, with hope and joy uh, if something like that were ever to happen. Well, that's what these women experienced that Sunday morning. So they had resigned themselves to go to the tomb and, and do one last final anointing, one final goodbye. And this final goodbye turns into the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And they were there to witness it. Jesus was alive. Now, these women 
could not have understood the full significance of the resurrection, right? How could they have known that? It, it, takes, it takes a while to, to, di- to digest this thing, but for them, for this moment, is, it is enough that Jesus is alive. And so the angel then gives them a task. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell the disciples. Verse 7, but go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. So let's us talk about what the resurrection means. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, on Thursday night, just before his arrest and crucifixion, he predicted that they would all fall away. But what he said to them was that after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. And so that's the last time Mark mentions the disciples as a group uh, in his gospel. It's just after Jesus has been arrested. And then they all fled just as Jesus predicted. And then Peter denied Jesus three times just as Jesus predicted. And so his best earthly friends deserted him and left him to face this trial and this crucifixion all by himself. Now, if that were me... I would have been quite angry and spiteful and resentful, and I would have held a grudge, right? And if Jesus was only a man, that's probably what he would have done too. But Jesus is so full of grace. He's so full of love for these guys uh, that, that he doesn't do that. Uh, and you would think his, his anger might be directly uh, attributed to Peter, especially, you know, I will, I will die before I leave you. And then in no time, he deserts him and denies him three times. And so, but remember, Jesus said, I will go ahead of you to Galilee after I'm raised. And now here the angel says the same thing to these women. Tell the disciples, he will go ahead of you into Galilee. Remember, just like he said, Galilee is the place where Jesus originally called the disciples up north, about 70 miles north of Jerusalem. So go to Galilee and there you will see him. But considering all the disciples had done, abandoning Jesus, why would he ever want to see them again, right? Why do you want to see people who abandon you in your time of need? Well, the reason is that the heart of the gospel is forgiveness and reconciliation. The heart of the gospel is forgiveness and reconciliation. The gospel means good news. The Greek word for gospel means good news. And the good news is Jesus Christ has died for our sins and he has risen from the dead. Well, why does this matter? Well, it matters because like the disciples and every other human being who has ever lived, we are sinners who fall short of God's perfect standard of righteousness And God cannot allow sinners into heaven or it would make his holy place soiled. He cannot allow us in there. And so once he allows sinners into heaven, it's no longer perfect. It's no longer holy. And so our dilemma, the human dilemma that we face is that there is a huge chasm that separates us from God. And what's What causes that chasm is our sin, and it separates us from God and his perfect holiness. Now, we cannot cross this chasm in our own power because we have all sinned, and no amount of good works that we have done can change that. And so, so many people misunderstand the way to get to heaven. Some think they can get there by being a good person. Now, the problem with that is that there are no good people, at least according to God's standards. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so God's standard is absolute perfection. So no matter how good you think you are, you fall short of God's holy standard. And so if you've ever lied, if you've ever cheated, if you've ever stolen, if you've ever lusted, then you and I have fallen short of God's standard and we cannot get to heaven. We must be holy. We must be sinless. And none of us are. So there are no good people. Some people think that if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'll get to heaven, right? Like if you put them on a scale and the good deeds go down and the bad deeds go up, well, you know, we're pretty good. 51% good, 49% bad. Again, uh, 
the, the, the sin in our lives causes us to be separated and, and causes this chasm between us and God. And so when we think like that, we're judging by human standards instead of judging by God's perfect, holy standards. So heaven is a gift for those who trust in Jesus, not in anything they have done, not in their own righteousness. So I'm imploring you not to make that mistake. You are not good enough. I am not good enough. None of us are good enough. None of us deserves to go to heaven and none of us will go to heaven unless someone handles this problem for us, this gap that we have. We need this gap for us bridged. And that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has bridged that gap for us, living the sinless life that we could not live. And then he voluntarily went to the cross to die for us, dying on our behalf, taking the punishment that we deserve on himself, And God will never punish the same sin twice. He's already punished Jesus if you have received him as your Lord and Savior. So on the cross, Jesus paid for every sin that has ever been committed, past, present, and future. And so God's gift to us on Easter morning is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. That's us on our side of the chasm. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what's on the other side of the chasm when we believe. So if we receive his gift and trust in Jesus alone for salvation and not in anything we have done to try to earn it, then God will forgive our sins and he will save us. Well, what will he save us from? He will save us from the penalty that is due for our sin. He will save us from eternity in hell, separated from him because we have rejected his son. And that's why Jesus repeatedly spoke way more about hell than he spoke about heaven, to warn the people that he spoke to about how terrible a place hell is and that they need to avoid it. So we would naturally ask, how do we receive this gift? How do we receive this gift so that we can cross this chasm? We simply choose to believe in Jesus for salvation. We say, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner and that I deserve punishment in hell, but I thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying the penalty that I owe and dying for my sins. And I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior and ask that you forgive my sins. That's it, a profession of faith. And when you do that, God forgives you of your sin and he reconciles you to himself and he gives you eternal life with him. Now, this news is so amazing because of its significance. Since God raised Jesus, that means he will raise us as well. And so we have no need to fear death. And for those of you who are grieving the loss of loved ones, uh, we know that if they believed in Jesus, then they are not dead. They are alive. They are in heaven with him, just as Jesus is alive. And they'll never die. They are free of all the infirmities of earth, right? There's no cancer there. There's no addiction there. There's no mental health issues. There's no sin there. Our loved ones are free, and that is what is ahead for us. They're rejoicing with Jesus, just as we will be. Now, many of us in this room have more of life behind us than we have in front of us, right? That's a a sad reality. Uh, But in a short time, we know that God will reunite us with these loved ones and with himself. And so if you're in pain today because of loss or because your life is very difficult, Jesus knows all about it. He, He went to the cross to cover all of our sin and all of the pain and all of life's ills. And so in heaven, these things will no longer exist. Uh, We just need to persevere, persevere a little while longer, and Jesus will raise us too. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. Now the angel who spoke in verse 7 said, uh, Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. And so Jesus Christ, by his sinless life and his sacrificial death and his resurrection and his ascension, he has already gone ahead of us into heaven. He is our pioneer. He has shown us the way. And so when we want to go to heaven, we don't go our own way. We go the way of our Savior. We follow him who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is how we follow our Lord to heaven. So if you're hearing my voice and you have not yet believed in Jesus for your salvation, I want you to know that you have to make your choice while you are still alive. 
There are no second chances for those who have already passed. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is given to man once to die, and then the judgment. So that's why I'm urging you to make your decision today. And you may not have as much time as you think. Think of what just happened this past week. A, 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 a cargo ship crashes into the key bridge. Uh, six guys who are working on the bridge just go in to do their jobs, plummet into the water. Their life ends in a heartbeat. They had no expectation that they were going to die that night. And yet, seconds later, they were dead in an instant. Our lives can end just as quickly. We're not guaranteed to the rest of today. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Jesus offers you his righteousness right now. And in exchange, he says, I will take your sin on myself. And when God looks at you after you've received Jesus Christ, he sees you clothed in Jesus' blood, and he does not hold your sin against you. It is the best trade you will ever get. And so I urge you to receive Jesus today. Now, last week during communion, uh, we distributed nails uh, like this one, and you hopefully received one of those on your way in, or uh, you remembered to bring yours from last week. And so I asked all of you to to keep the nail present near you, on your desk, in your pocket, in your purse, uh, so you could be reminded of what Jesus did by being nailed to the cross. And I wanted us to remember last week that, that, that this nail It should have been for us. This nail was intended for us. And yet Jesus took this nail for us. He paid the price for our sins that we could not pay ourselves. So I hope you had some time to look at your nail uh, and and hate your sin and remember what Jesus did for us and and consider the incredible sacrifice that he made for us. And I asked you to bring your nail back this week uh, because uh, I wanted us to do something with it this week. And uh, if you don't have a nail, you can raise your hands and the ushers will bring you a nail. Uh, If you have one, we're going to to, uh, hand them back to the ushers during communion this morning as we pass out the bread. We're going to put our nails back in the bowls. And the reason we're doing that is because I want you to think of the nail as representing your sin. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has nailed your sin to the cross, and he has forgiven that sin. And that is the beauty of the cross and the resurrection. And it also represents the fact that if you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you to help you from continuing to sin. And so his death paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But that does not mean we should keep sinning. So if there's a secret sin in your life, I'm asking that as you put this nail back into the bowl, I want you to repent of that sin, to unburden yourself from the power of that sin and resolve to put that sin to death through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Easter is Christianity's most sacred day. Uh, Easter is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. But it's also about the fact that because Jesus was raised, we too will be raised as believers in Jesus Christ to eternal life with him. That is the good news of the gospel, brothers and sisters. So believe, be saved, and be changed. Worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen. risen. He is risen. He is risen. risen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we just thank you so much for your sacrifice and for this amazing plan by which sinners can be saved. Lord, no human being would invent such a plan. This has to come from God. Only God would take the punishment of sinful men who betrayed Jesus. And uh, Lord, the people that that, uh, you sent him to save uh, crucified him. Uh, Who would ever think of such a plan except for our holy and gracious and merciful God? Lord, we thank you for this. We place our trust and hope in Jesus. We look forward to the day that he comes again. And Lord, we just long to gaze on his face and thank him personally for what he's done. Lord, we just thank you that he's alive and we praise you in his precious name. Amen.